So I'd just like to thank you for, for joining this evening. Uh, my name's Owen Martin, and I've recently joined the Ashtrap Fernley uh, Museum. And we're really, I think myself and the whole team are delighted to have uh, Michael Martyr and Sarah Elliotson with us this evening. They'll, of course, be reflecting on Basel Abbas and Ruin Abu Rame's uh, current exhibition, which is uh, behind me and upstairs. Um, and I think one of a few of the, the discussions that we had in advance of, of this discussion, sort of a preliminary conversation, revolved around the significance of uh, the biological as a tool for thinking about the social and the political, um, the historical, or sorry, the um, the meaning of mediation on the part of the artists, as well as the layering of conceptual, historical, and material references. And rather than inviting a single speaker to discuss some of these topics or engage with some of these topics, we wanted to initiate a conversation with two, um, two thinkers and makers uh, who could uh, draw upon their specific fields of uh, inquiry and, and hopefully uh, highlight aspects of the exhibition that um, we not, may not be aware of yet. Uh, I should note that Solve Ostobo, our director, was the curator of this exhibition, so I'm sort of uh, here as a mediator, if you will. Um, and I will really just lightly moderate this evening's discussion. Um, the talk will be followed by a question and answer period, so please, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask them. Um, and uh, with that, I'll just run through uh, briefly the biographies of both of our speakers. So Michael Martyr, Martyr is the um, Ikerbos Research Professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of the Basque Country in Spain. His writings span the fields of ecological theory, phenomenology, and political thought. He is the author of numerous scientific articles and monographs, including Plant Thinking, Phenomena Critique, Logos, The Philosopher's Plant, Dust, Energy Dreams, Heidegger, Political Categories, Pyropolitics, Dump Philosophy, Hegel's Energy, Green Mask, Green Mass, The Philosophy of Passengers, and The Phoenix Complex, among others. So, quite a prolific author. <laughs> and then Sarah Eliasson is a artist and filmmaker based here in Oslo. Uh, she is currently a PhD candidate at the uh, in artistic research at the Oslo National Academy of Arts, with ongoing re artistic research with an ongoing artistic research project entitled "Mediating Uncertainties." Current investigations explore propaganda histories and how ideologies are normalized within contemporary images, technologies, and moving image cultures. Ellison's projects move between exhibition spaces cinemas, and sites in the public sphere. I think something we'll probably touch on this evening. Her work has been exhibited both locally and internationally, and her films, Still as a Bird and a Blank Slate, have been played extensively at film festivals, uh, such as the Venice Film Festival, the Film Festival in Rotterdam, and Sundance. Uh, Site-specific projects include Not Worth It, Under the Park, as well as the Feedback Loop. Uh, and that was at the Monk Museum here in Oslo. Uh, Eliasson participated in the Whitney Independent Study Program as a studio fellow after completing her MFA uh, at the San Francisco Art Institute. And her most recent project, Images and Talking Back to Them, is currently on exhibition at the at Kunstgarten Seuss. It closes on Sunday, so I would encourage you, if you have a chance, to go uh, view the exhibition before it closes. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank you, and we'll uh, start the conversation. So there's, you know, there's so many uh, points of entry into the, the topics that we've been discussing now, previously, virtually, and then this afternoon. Um, but I'd like to sort of begin the conversation, if you're, if you're happy with it, just around the idea of the ecological. You know, I know, Michael, that this has been a, a very important point of, of research for you, and uh, I know that we, we, we discussed it extensively. So. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you so much for uh, for the question and for the introduction, also. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with with all of you. And uh, uh, many thanks for organizing uh, this this event. It means a lot to me, especially because it links together 
two of the ongoing uh, research interests that I have in there, much more than research interests, they're really uh, uh, very passionate commitments. Uh, one on thinking with and about digital life and uh, ecological processes that uh, are also associated with it, and the other uh, being political philosophy specifically related to situations of extreme violence and oppression, such as the situation of what is going on now in Palestine, uh, addressed by uh, Basel and, and uh, Rouen. Uh, and so it really means a lot to be able to reflect together with you in this context on the, the intimate connection between these two uh, interests. Now, as, as for the question of the ecological, to me, this is not uh, a specialized area of thought or philosophy. Uh, it really touches upon uh, every every single level from psychological existence to our physiologies, uh, to social and political life, to uh, the very notion of being in the world, of uh, uh, of being able to live uh, in, in a meaningful way, to share uh, energy with others, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So um, many of the ecological disasters that we can think about yesterday we, uh, in a different context talked about Chernobyl, as one of the really uh, significant uh, ecological disasters of the late 20th century, but that is still with us to this day, and perhaps even in a more extreme uh, case, given the uh, war that Russia is waging in Ukraine. Uh, these ecological disasters that disrupt uh, the ecosystems and metabolic exchanges that make those ecosystems living uh, entities, uh, are not separable, to my mind, from um, psychological, social, and political disasters where trauma is uh, inscribed onto the, uh, the bodies, psyches, and communities uh, in such a way that it presents itself as an oppressive present that refuses to become the past, refuses to open up the space to the future as well, to a livable future. Uh, and uh, uh, probably this this is what we can learn from uh, ecological disasters, the negative uh, kind of face or side of ecology being a trauma that is of a piece with psychological, social, political traumas uh, that stunt the, the growth and the be being of, uh, of individuals and communities as well. So uh, we were just before uh, we sat down, we were of course discussing uh, your most recent work, and that's where it was mainly on view. And we sort of we, we were engaged with some of the ideas in that exhibition and how they might sort of relate to this exhibition. And Michael just mentioned that uh, significance of trauma, thinking about trauma through the biological, and I think your work address, you know, in a way addresses that as well. The, the sort of Trauma of mass uh, mass media and the way the violence is represented in the mass media, particularly your work um, in Tijuana. And I wonder if, if you might be able to yeah, share a bit with us about that. Yeah, um, just trying to follow up a bit what Michael talked about too, when you talk about how the trauma is kind of uh, is something uh, where the past cannot um, or the present cannot become the past. So you're kind of stuck in this, mm -hmm. uh, this constant uh, situation, if I understand your uh, mm -hmm. description of it. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the work we have here and also uh, this idea of um, the fragmented that we touched upon. And I think that was something that I was thinking a lot about in my own work, which is up now. Like, how can you actually uh, do the opposite of... Um, this super linear narrative, and I think that's also something that they have uh, talked about themselves. Like, how can uh, the fragmented actually be a strategy for for avoiding that super linear narrative that very often can be violent and that also kind of refuses to open up to a past? And also thinking about that in some sort of like immediacy culture that we're living. And I think the work in Tijuana that you're referring to. Um, where I talk with Saif Valencia, who's a philosopher, who talks a lot about exactly how the, the work of digital media is to erase memory. And uh, I think that was a little bit what I was thinking about with the exhibition was kind of having these different, it's actually different conversations with different practitioners of media and, and, and thinking and how to uh, 
to hold these conversations as kind of containers of memories, their memories, but also connected with my own memories of those meetings and, and kind of insisting on some sort of a past, but not as a super linear narrative of the past, but rather in fragments. Mm -hmm. um, I think they, uh, they do it like more. I mean, they, they take the fragments also very materially in the space, which I think is really exciting about this exhibition and also it kind of refuses for me as a viewer to get that overview. And I think that's something that I think sort of I touched upon in the interview that I read um, some parts of too. And I think that is a very strong position um, that they hold in this exhibition. I, I, yeah, I spaced out a bit from your question, and, but uh, yes. And, and this, is, this is where I think it's so important uh, that, um, uh, that the artists work with plants that are definitely not a part of the scenery, but in fact, they are the holders of memory in a sense. And we can talk about plant memory in a very uh, material, very literal sense of uh, uh, incorporating uh, the elements of the organic decomposition of what they, they are feeding on from below the 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 uh, from from below not only on sunlight but also on decaying organic matter and that becoming a kind of memory that is inscribed in the plant body and that becomes a plant uh, but i think the complexity of the work here is that plant memory is actually entwined with forgetting and oblivion so when we uh, hear and see the uh, meditations on the pine forests that were planted on top of the ruined Palestinian villages precisely to hide uh, those sites of destruction and violence and to naturalize them in that sense. We could say that plants not only hold that memory, but, but they also can be conduits toward oblivion. And there, the references to fire are really extremely important. Uh, right, something that is can be also very tragic, the ever uh, increasing forest fires in this age of global heating and the Anthropocene that, of course, are also uh, ravaging areas of the Middle East and uh, of Palestine as well, uh, and, and fires that burn through uh, uh, pine forests can reveal the, the ruins that are uh, hidden by, by these trees. So uh, we get a very complex, non-idealizing relation to plant life. Uh, and, and I think this is really something that is difficult to achieve and has been uh, achieved by, by the artists here in this context. So you're thinking about how kind of the plants are holders of memories, no? But yes. it could also be instrumentalized as like, almost like blockages. Definitely. I think that's really interesting and, and we also in one of our conversation that came up we were talking about plants as uh, mediators as well mm -hmm. uh, i jumped on your list but uh, <laughs> um which i thought was really interesting also considering how they also change whatever passes through them mm. so the role of a mediator is also something that um, affects its surroundings Yes, uh, and, and what, what, is, what is interesting here is that uh, mediation is not uh, simply a kind of vanishing, middling position, but in fact, if we adopt as much as possible a vegetal perspective, we could say that everything begins from that middle of mediation. So it is not that there is a pre-givenness uh, of the world that exists beforehand, uh, and the sky and the earth receive their sense as what is above and what is below as the sky and the earth through plant mediations. Uh, uh, and, and so in, in that sense, I think what really interests me here is the way that artistic practices can plug into those already existing mediations uh, in uh, the natural world, let's say. And artists can follow the plants to a certain extent in becoming the mediators of the mediators, mm -hmm. the, the facilitators of this process, but uh, which actually flourishes from out of the middle. Uh, it, it is not that we're given the extremes that need to be mediated, let's say, the, the artwork and the spectators, but in fact, the most interesting space and the germinative, uh, uh, germinational space is the one that is really in the middle. And the artwork and the spectator become who and what they are from out of that space. All right? This mm -hmm. is maybe a, a different perspective that we're invited to if we take seriously this mediatory role mm -hmm. of plant life and of the artist as a, as a mediator as well. And I think that's also when thinking about some of the, the material that, I mean, a lot of the material is archival, no? So it's the different dance videos, especially in the, this 
main theme. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And uh, taking you up on this idea of um, the artist uh, and the role of a mediator, uh, so seeing how they also they re choreograph some of these archival, uh, some of the archival imagery, you know, from from dances, from weddings, from protests. Exactly. Yeah. There was a sort of re choreography or a, a re presentation of some of these movements translated uh, a number of times, actually. Um, so, at, at a, at a really, you know, like fragmented, you know, in a sense. I, I think that's really, if I think about them, um, the role as mediator really further and going back to this idea of how the mediator also changes whatever they mediate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's very present in Basel Lomans' work and also how the, the performers are kind of inscribing themselves in the landscapes of the ruin and becoming part of these landscapes. I think that is really, for me, I think it's a really strong experience and I've been sitting here with the works. Um, yeah. it's, it's interesting, in a, in a different conversation, Basel and Ruan uh, referred to uh, the way in which they found, found some of these ruins um, is through the first follow up app. But then, uh, then they follow the, the sort of vegetal traces. They follow the cactus that was there previously. And I think that's quite uh, palpable in, in what that, uh, that suggests. That that is the, the trace which leads one to this, this site. Uh, and, and I think what is at stake here is also the movement of repetition, which is not a mere repetition, but in fact, uh, perhaps the first step toward dealing with this trauma uh, uh, that is multi-layered and multi-leveled, uh, that is environmental, social, political, psychological, individual. Um, and uh, uh, so the most difficult question is really how does one work through a trauma as this uh, present that refuses to become a past? Because obviously we see that the effects, the, the, the source of the violence is still there and it's not abating. It's in fact, as we, we know, sadly, uh, actually getting worse. Uh, uh, so instead of getting paralyzed in the face of the absolute overwhelming violence of, of this trauma, the movement of repetition, even in such an uh, artistic gesture as re uptaking the materials and, and representing -pre -re them in a different context, is already a strategy of working through a trauma, I would say, instead of being, uh, because in the repetition, this a minimal temporality emerges, a minimal difference emerges between the present and the past. And one can give oneself the space, the, again, the minimal space to breathe where there is a suffocation by the absolutely overwhelming present that is looming over everyone and everything in this place. One of the, the sort of other aspects that we had discussed uh, earlier was around the, the idea of decay and that holding the potential for uh, a livable future. Um, and that's, in a sense, you know, when you think of the, the Syrian thistle, which, um, which erupts in a sort of in ground which has been disturbed uh, and then grows and then decays and actually provides the nutrients for the next. The next sort of cycle of vegetation. There's something quite uh, poignant about that, and it is it, it becomes a uh, an object in in the sort of constellation uh, within this within Basel and practice. Yes, and maybe to extrapolate from this a little bit, I would say that uh, uh, Basel and Ruan's practice could uh, also play this role of the Syrian thistle of the. Of, of the kind of decay that can stimulate a new growth in a place which uh, which actually stunts all, all growth in a sense. Uh, and, and here we see the uh, underside of the continuum of different traumas that are inflicted again on the environment, on individuals, on societies, where uh, the trauma is not only that which is ever present, but also is the unmetabolizable, that which does not change, that which does not decay, what is preserved in its uh, uh, apparently frozen identity. Uh, and so to allow this decay to happen is already again to work through the trauma. Uh, uh, and and it, all of this, of course, is exacerbated by the Anthropocene, which we could say at the broadest level of abstraction is defined by the massive injection of non-decomposable artifacts of human industrial production into 
a life world into the environment, right? And uh, the elements of the Anthropocene are very visible. The traces of the Anthropocene are vis visible in the exhibition uh, uh, as well. For instance, uh, in the part where you have a kind of an attempt at the sorting out, at the decluttering, uh, a kind of dynamic system of maybe classification where uh, you, you start with uh, 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 pine cones and other vegetal materials and then this pyramid build up to the non-decomposable packages, uh, 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 plastic bottles and, and so on. Uh, to my mind, this was a very clear comment uh, on the Anthropocene and the way it's embedded and reinforces and feeds upon and at the same time nourishes many of the violent practices that uh, are happening in Palestine. So uh, jump-starting decay and decomposition is again a, a, a redemptive movement uh, that is doubly resonant both in the context of political violence and in the context of the kind of violence inflicted onto a uh, life world. You think of decay as something really like a positive force. Yes, right? absolutely. So, Absolutely, because I think in the Anthropocene, really, the problem is the non-decayable, and mm -hmm. uh, th this is what really clutters and clogs ecosystems, the microplastics that we find everywhere, from waterways to now plant tissues even, that have imbibed them. Uh, and uh, not, not to speak of spent nuclear materials mm -hmm. that simply do not lose their radioactivity for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years sometimes. Uh, so as I see it, decay is not something to be shunned or uh, uh, to run away from, but something to be really encouraged uh, uh, precisely in order to, uh, to, 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 to rejuvenate the very soil for future growth. Uh, and, and I very much see this uh, happening in, in the exhibition here as well. Michael, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned earlier about the the lack of decay, actually, going back to another project that you're, um, you're involved in or you're, uh, you're working on, the lack of decay in Chernobyl, actually, that there has been this incredible sort of vegetal growth, but that um, microorganisms, well, let me not finish, let me, let me pass that over to you, but I think it's interesting. Yes, so uh, to create another tentative link to, to Chernobyl, and if you, if you think about it, these sites of, uh, uh, of disasters are uh, linked to invisible threads that we can try to follow here. Um, uh, it has been celebrated very much in world media, in international media, the fact that wildlife has returned to Chernobyl, that plants and, uh, and animals are flourishing where most human beings have left. Um, and, and so um, it's presented as a success story instead of an incredible disaster site. Uh, I think a lot rides on this because Chernobyl is more than a si single place in Ukraine. It is uh, a laboratory of the Anthropocene. It is an experiment in how the, uh, uh, our planet in the epoch of the Anthropocene could look like, not in exceptional disaster sites, but as, as a whole. And so a lot rides on we coding, recasting it in positive light. But if one looks closer, and scientists uh, have done this, uh, the soil of Chernobyl is incredibly poor in the sense in which uh, uh, radiation has interfered with the fragile communities of decomposers, uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, other microorganisms that do the work of decomposition uh, have been uh, obliterated by these high doses of radiation. And so on the forest floor of the Red Forest in Chernobyl, you have uh, an incredible accumulation of dry matter from plants, tree trunks, uh, fallen leaves, and so on from the last 37 years. And none of this is decaying into the soil. So we can uh, safely say that the return of wildlife is largely unsustainable because unless you have a renewal of the soil, no new growth can actually happen there, not to mention the ever increasing possibility of forest fires. Uh, in, near uh, the exploded reactor that are incredibly dangerous, not only because of their vicinity to the reactor, but because they raise into the atmosphere large amounts of radioactive particles with ashes and so on, and create another another fallout, as it were. So uh, another another link here, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, we we also sort of touched on this idea of, and perhaps we're going back. Uh, something we've already uh, discussed, but this idea of layering, right? That the exhibition 
has one layer after another after another of, of, of sort of references, and it's something that uh, that you mentioned, Sarah. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I think it was the first thing that kind of struck me when I saw this exhibition and how yeah how the artist worked very intentionally with layers, both materially in the space, um, but also thinking of times and history with layers. Um, and I think it was interesting for me to meet you, Michael, and, and talk about how you, you saw this happen through the plants and, and also understanding more of that um, entrance into the work, just thinking of these, these sites that we see specifically in, in this I think about uh, quite a lot and, and how these sites uh, contain these layers through the vegetable life, but also the site in itself, how the site has been witnessed through a trauma and how that, that site plays such a big role in the, in the, in the images that they've shot themselves. Um, and I, maybe I should to bring back a little bit, maybe it's parallel to the decay uh, or a link to the idea of the decay, but how uh, again, how they reinscribe these particular sites that have all these layers of histories to them that insist on staying on these sites, which is kind of that, um, I mean, something else in decay, because, but it's, it's a ruin of something, no? So it's a, I mean, we know what, but it's, it, it is a ruin that they kind of insist on, um, um, kind of inscribing new histories onto. And I think that's really powerful with the performers who are there, um, Kind of reenacting dances from like both celebratory situations, but also funerals, funerals and weddings, and also protests, uh, and coming together on these sites, kind of bringing back new, um, bringing up memories, but also kind of insisting on that site being also an empowering site. So I'm just thinking about that as a potential kind of parallel to the decay that mm. something might become something else, I guess. Um, instead mm -hmm. of this cyclical return that we often think about with mm -hmm. repetition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is something more than just a cyclical kind of return. Yes. It has like uh, a, maybe a reflexivity that kind of adds into every uh, repetition mm -hmm. of sorts. Yes, so maybe in ecological terms we could say that this is the difference between renewability on the one hand and regeneration on the other, mm -hmm. because renewability treating uh, uh, um, uh, the world as a collection of resources simply insists on an infinite repetition of the same destructive practices mm -hmm. that would be sustained by, by these resources that the resources would allow for. While regeneration allows for something new to emerge thanks to the decomposition and the dissolving of the old. So there's, I, I think there's a, a, a very big difference between these two environmental practices that then translate into political and artistic uh, options and choices. I just as well. want to bring that back to the layering. Yes. I was just thinking that when you, you, you're talking, because it's, I mean, it's the layering of the image in the image in the image, and then the times, uh, the histories and the histories and the histories, and then, and exactly how, um, how keeping these layers there at the same time also add something else than that um, non-generative kind of, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the rep repetition without a generating potential and it's bringing these different layers together in one space is, uh, again, not forcing one super linear narrative, but keeping these like multiple histories present at the same time. I think it's really strong. Yeah. It opens up to new possibilities by constantly engaging again and again with with the specific movement, with the specific image, and, and through that process, other, as you said, other possibilities emerge. Mm -hmm. And also repeating the history is that, uh, for example, these videos of these particular uh, dances or this, from these different moments that exist potentially on the internet and then taking back into the space. And then again, they keep, they, as I understood it, they generate more and more and more works, you know, that kind of enters into different exhibitions, which exactly. again, is uploaded, so there's an archive online and it's an archive offline. Exactly. So there is this growing sort of online archive, and then of course, yeah, the work evolves given the each context is presented. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael, one of the things you said you referred to earlier was that, and we're returning slightly to an early point you made, but. Um, how does one mourn in, 
what is the a present drama? And I thought that that really stuck with me. That idea that how does how do we mourn something which you're continually experiencing? Um, and I, yeah, I wonder if, if you might be able to to expand on that a bit more. Yes, definitely. And I think one of the clues that uh, we see in the exhibition is precisely a movement of repetition with a difference. So the, uh, that movement of simply repeating and opening up the minimal space uh, and, and time of difference from the present is already the first step toward the work of mourning. But of course, uh, it it is a very operatic, almost impossible situation uh, uh, where uh, no matter, uh, we, we get a kind of Sisyphean work of mourning. Uh, we can start it and then immediately the uh, the stone rolls uh, back down the mountain and uh, uh, we, we, we get uh, uh, under its weight. Um, so so um, it, it is not, a, again, a very linear process that can go by steps or stages but needs to be re reinitiated again from multiple perspectives. And I think this is really the strength of the exhibition, that it gives many perspectives and possibilities for starting or ju jump-starting the work of mourning, the process of decomposition decay that would allow for new growth, not through a single recipe that the artist would prescribe, but through multiple possibilities uh, that would be taken up uh, in, in, in different sequences. Uh, as it were. So every every single person is invited through their own journey through the exhibition to carve out that path that makes sense to them of what that uh, work of mourning could look like. In a sense. Yeah. I mean, it has a, I mean, even it, it's not a context that I, as an artist, kind of, I mean, I come as an outsider into the, into their w world, but it, the, the healing quality is also seen very present, even though um, it's not my trauma, but I can sense that it, it's and with the sound and the rhythmic and the pulse, and the, it has this, uh, it works on a very affective uh, level for me. And it's, uh, I think that is also a strength, even though it's like a complex material from different digital archives, it's like re performed works, it, but it's still something about the sound that also. And they uh, refer to the echo, right? And the mm. title, which is also goes with its repetition, but uh, it's more than a repetition, right? You said something mm. that the echo is uh, is not a mere reflection. It's it's like the yes. one and the other. It, it's interesting if we go back to the mythical sources of the echo and Narci Narcissus story in, in Ovid, for instance. Uh, echo is the one who repeats the words of the other or the endings of the words of the other. And Narcissus is the one who is uh, uh, looking at his own image, right? So there is a kind of, uh, wh where, wherever there is echo, there is also Narcissus and there is a mismatch between them in the sense, a, a necessary, essential mismatch in the sense of repeating oneself as opposed to repeating the other. And it's a, it's a story that doesn't have a resolution, as it were. So this uh, m movement toward healing is not, never, uh, I think, possible in the sense of making whole and re recreating a, uh, a totality uh, once again. It is not the work of gluing together the shattered uh, bits and pieces in order to recreate the whole vessel. But uh, again, it's uh, a healing that maybe we could say is more vegetal in the sense of actually taking up and fully allowing oneself to channel through oneself all of the suffering and uh, and and the decay and, and and so on and to grow out of that experience without ever creating a kind of an organic totality or an inorganic totality so it's uh, uh, whenever plants are involved as they heavily are here in in these works uh the the mode of healing or even if we prefer the kind of religious language of redemption, vegetal redemption, uh, is never a making whole that creates an organismic totality. It allows a proliferating multiplicity that is the plant mm -hmm. to flourish and uh, without, without ever uh, sort of being, again, a suffocating whole in that sense. Michael, you spoke earlier about the idea of uh, the plant structure versus a sort of animal structure having uh, opening up to multiple possibilities that it wasn't a singular 
object that it uh, of course Matic, you know it opened up to the other possibilities and that that seems to be a sort of strategy of, of Plato in your work as well yes yes I think when when we talk about the multiplicity of points of entry and uh, pathways to follow toward working through trauma again it is not only the content of the uh, much of the ex exhibition that is vegetal but even the method or the the living form of it is vegetal as well in the sense in which uh, uh, plants are not uh, organismic totalities they are quite open-ended in terms of their body plan right so they grow in the modular way which means that they can complexify their living architectures uh, by repeating the same module over and over again. So repetition is again uh, a vegetal strategy too, but not a repetition of the same, uh, but one that, that creates different configurations and assemblages mm -hmm. that then uh, uh, give us this being that we know as a plant. Uh, so um, uh, absolutely that openness to the outside world, uh, the capacity to receive and to nourish oneself on the opening up to the solar other, for instance, to, mm. to the soil, and, and also the proliferating open-ended multiplicity that the plant is in its dynamic being. All of this, I think, is present not only in the content, but also in the dynamic form of the exhibition. Mm. In, its, in its sort of very structure, yes. yeah, including the, the, the fragmented material, the very fragmented uh, sort of uh, projections and, uh, and many other sort of aspects of the is there, would you like to, to add anything else? Is there a specific points um, that, that you'd, like to, you'd like to mention? I think we've, we've talked about decay holding a, uh, the potential for a livable future, um, the different modes of sort of mediation, um, trauma and worldlessness. I, I would perhaps like to return to that idea of worldlessness, because <laughs> yeah. um, I don't think we've quite uh, expanded on expanded on that or engage with that as much um, yeah I, I do feel like that's your because uh, <laughs> you brought in the word worldlessness yes I think we should. yes I, I think worldlessness in the sense is very much linked to my mind to the notion of survival what what does it mean to survive not as a, as a being who is still alive despite everything that has happened? But what does it mean to outlive one's world? That one's world is taken away vi violently, is destroyed by the forces of occupation that keep suppressing and repressing it, and yet one is still there, right? I think this is the starting point with which uh, Basil and Ruan are, are, are coming to us, as it were, right? This is, I can't obviously speak to them, but at least from what I have experienced from the exhibition, I can really sense that they, they feel this uh, that, that as a given, as what is a priori from the beginning given to them, is this condition of worldlessness. They are there, but their world is taken away from them. And then the question is, what, do, what does one do? How does one survive not merely as a living, uh, nourishing body inside that situation of worldlessness, but how can one reimagine and recreate another world together with others, whether human or not, uh, despite this, this condition of worldlessness, right? Despite uh, being uh, almost like a shipwrecked uh, a survivor who, who is uh, outside of any uh, uh, comfortable coordinates for, for existence. Um, and uh, of course, in the history of philosophy, the idea of worldlessness uh, in the work of Martin Heidegger uh, is used to describe the being of inanimate beings. So for Heidegger, a stone is worldless. A stone is without the world. And we see lots of inorganic materials here, stones as well, uh, as reminders of that. Uh, and, and Heidegger thinks that only a human being, only a human Dasein is world-having, uh, world-forming, world-creating. Animals and plants for him are somewhere in the gray zone, in the ambiguous position of what he calls poverty in the world, Feltarm. They are poor in the world, so they have some sort of an access to the world, but they are not world-creating, according to Heidegger. So um, it is a challenge then in, in the condition of worldlessness, first of all, to try to regain the world, but maybe to regain it in the sense in which uh, uh, in all the repetitions that one engages in, one does not repeat the violence of which occupation is a part, the metaphysical violence that denies the world 
not only to a particular group of human beings, but to other living beings who are not human, like plants or animals. How does one then reimagine a world and, 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 and recreate a world uh, in which the violence of which occupation is an offshoot is not repeated in relation to other living beings? I think this, this is maybe the, the biggest challenge in that sense. I just think it's really interesting to, to hear what you're saying, thinking about this particular space and how they also resolve the space with their works. I mean, we're talking about the, you know, the, the fragmented and, the, and the never giving like a whole full idea or a picture of a situation, but really how the, the space, uh, you can sense these repetition through, through the space and the different like layers of the, of the architecture itself, but also, like you say, this different connection between objects between the non-organic and the organic, mm -hmm. between the, the images which are archival, which also like the screenshots from the poem, so the different media that are present, but also different elements kind of function together in, in a whole that I cannot fully uh, grasp from any one perspective in this um, space. Um, or even the reflections of one work from above, mm -hmm. sort of infiltrating the work below the the sort of borders between one part of the exhibition or one artwork and uh, uh, between the two are sort of tenuous. I and think. the sound mm. leads kind of everywhere. Exactly. You cannot even in the furthest room. I think I hear a bit of this insulation and it's uh, yeah the reflection, like you say, and it's it's connected, but it still has very different qualities. No, and, no. And, and of course, that stands in a very sharp contrast to what we see also depicted here and what is happening on the ground in reality in Israel-Palestine, mm -hmm. which is the separation barrier, the apartheid mm -hmm. wall that Israel has built uh, uh, to, to cut off Palestinian territories from uh, other Palestinian territories to carve the land. And so we, we, we get this very... Uh, on the one hand, the, the, the power the power of the occupiers that is linked to uh, establishing and defining very rigid demarcations that are actually very inorganic, purely inorganic, the, the, the separation wall, uh, and, and the kind of cross-contamination that we see here in, in the exhibition that challenges this way of going about the world of carving it up in, into these separate boxes, which is obviously not only the act of the occupying authority, but also the act of many of the metaphysical systems and systems of science that we know in the West, which characterize and box beings in their particular categories, uh, separating them from one another where they're actually living assemblages and connections. But it's also, they, they're not negating it, but we have blockages all around in this space too. I mean, it's, it's, uh, even the, uh, the metal holders uh, that kind of hides the plants upstairs and then these different mm -hmm. layers, like, it's kind of like, uh, it's, they can also function as blockages towards the, uh, yeah, to okay. get that full, to get an image and even uh, some of the material from the videos, you have the roads with the, the roadblocks mm. and the, the stop, basically, you know. The rise and come yeah. to an end, actually, in the number, in yeah. this one sequence. Um, so there is that that absolute break, that, that uh, sort of dismissal of the horizon. Which, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's interesting that they also like it's not that they insist on on, on a utopian kind of way of being no. this material. Like it still like keeps the the blockages a part of that, yeah. and they find a way to to um, to work together with the different materials mm -hmm. around the blockages. But perhaps those blockages are the traces or the reflections of the separation wall. That they are, they are then uh, responding to uh, uh, dialogically, artistically, with this kind of cross contamination of materials, of media, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the blockages that are present here are obviously their their refusal to uh, deny reality on the ground, which is carved up by by these blocks, mm -hmm. but to engage with the blocks otherwise. Yeah, but right? not creatively, right. no. So it's creatively, also actually, absolutely. Uh, basically hiding the plant, protecting it, that's, uh, that's how yes. I read it. Mm. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, and thanks to both of our uh, speakers, and thank you, Michael, for traveling all the way to, to Oslo to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.